Last year I had the unique opportunity to work with one, and uh, we did a little digital experiment in space, so uh, I'm here to advocate and promote a little bit uh, the post-quantum uh, encryption. So imagine the nightmare scenario of uh, everyone here. Uh, our, one of our satellites in space is being hacked. And it turns out that's not then also the total number of sort of cyber attacks on this satellite infrastructure. And both keep a steady pace almost exponentially, which is not surprising because, of course, satellites are fancy computers, so they have uh, all the computer security issues as well. But luckily, they also have access to all the security features. So I hope everyone here who works with satellites does some sort of encryption with their satellite. And uh, I'm mentioning here classical encryption because that's what we are using today, some, some digital form of encryption. But our society also moves towards the post-quantum computer age. So we're not quite there yet. We know that uh, we can build quantum computers and we know that we can run quantum algorithms on these computers. And some of these quantum algorithms actually break our current encryption standards that we use every day in uh, internet and so on. But these algorithms are, uh, they require quite a sufficient uh, quantum hardware to run on, which we currently don't yet have. And the National Institute of Standards and Technology estimates that uh, in about 10 years, these quantum computers will be here. So we are in this time slot where we get some time to develop new algorithms to replace our current encryption standards. But you may argue that the way you're doing it right now with uh, your satellites is, uh, you know, well, I can use AES-256 and that's quantum secure. And that's correct. Uh, AES has not been found to be that vulnerable against quantum computing attacks. Uh, however, the other thing that the satellite industry is currently doing is to use uh, pre-shared keys. So you program your password into the satellite, launch it, and you're good. And there's some issues with that. Uh, one I heard while talking to some people here, apparently uh, when the file system gets radiation damage and you damage your key, you're locked out of your satellite. But another thing is uh, pre-shared key infrastructure doesn't scale well. So another trend, uh, of course, is to have entire fleets of satellites with, with hundreds or so of, of satellites and then when you do pre-shared secrets on those satellites, it gets kind of messy of what do you do when you replace a satellite or add one. So I'm not the first one to advocate for public key infrastructure here. Um, the way that would work is you would use uh, asymmetric uh, encryption methods where you have a random password, use the public key, encrypt it and, and send it to you. You can use the private key, decrypt it, and you both have uh, an exchanged key, which you then, again, can use for AES or another quantum cell algorithm. But the issue with the current uh, key exchange mechanism, like Diffie-Hellman or RSA, uh, is that they are very much vulnerable against quantum computing attacks. So there is the need for a new tier of algorithms. And the NIST uh, realized that some six years ago, and just uh, last month, they announced the winners of a six-year competition for the research community to come up with new algorithms. And one of the winning algorithms is Crystal's Kyber, which is a general purpose uh, key exchange mechanism. And uh, it was, during those six years, uh, tested for security and, of course, benchmarked for performance measurements and such. And all of that happened mostly on x86 hardware, so real computers where it's going to be used on Earth. But uh, we're on a small satellite conference. We don't usually send out uh, full big computers into space. We are in the world of embedded systems. And in our case, we had access to a nanosatellite, a three-unit nanosatellite already in orbit, uh, which was running on a 32-bit, 64 megahertz microcontroller, running a real-time operating system, so not a, a full operating system, and, and of course, the CubeSat space protocol. 
the thing with embedded systems, if you want to do encryption right, there's quite a few tricks you need to work around. So I mentioned that you need to come up with a random password that you want to exchange. And you don't want your attacker to be able to guess that password. So you need a guaranteed number of bits of entropy from a random number generator. And, and random number generator is a whole topic for itself. But in essence, on, on Linux externally as a, another chip that you communicate to, there's even quantum random number generators nowadays. But we ended up using the software random number generator, pseudo random number generator, in the standard library, which sounds bad at first, but it still works out if uh, taken care of the right way. What you can see here is the beginning of a, a key exchange using Kyber. And on the left side, we have the ground station, Alice, which is a, a laptop x86 architecture running Linux. So there we do have access to a secure random number generator. And you can see that this one is used during the key generation. And then on the right side, we have Bob or our spooky one satellite in space. And the insecure random number is only used during the optional uh, key authentication to make sure both parties have the same key. And with this, we successfully demonstrated a key exchange from the ground station to the satellite. And you should note that it would not work with this random number generator between two satellites, because then it would not be secure. Um, this is our setup with the, the ground station. So we have Spooky in space, uh, a Swiss ground station, and uh, a Singapore ground station. And they are connected through a remote shell. But this one is also post-quantum cryptographically secure. So in the future, this whole uh, setup could be quantum secure. And a bit of an anecdote about the satellite, because I mentioned uh, it doesn't belong to us. Uh, and it, it belonged to the National University of Singapore. They were doing a very successful demonstration of quantum entanglement in space. So they would exchange entangled photons as a key. And that's a different concept, because you're working on the principle of quantum physics. But we had then the idea after they were done with their experiments, and the uh, satellite was just kind of hanging there, uh, waiting for decommission uh, into the atmosphere. So uh, my uh, advisor came up to me, and he was like, Simon, do you want to program a satellite? And I was like, yes, please. That sounds like fun. And it was a, a lot of fun. Uh, 10 out of 10 uh, would satellite again. I can recommend it. But uh, then we had about two or three months of time before it would crash to understand the firmware, because we had never worked with satellites before, and then also implement this Kyber algorithm into an experiment that we could perform. And uh, I'm over-exaggerating here a bit, but uh, almost on the last pass, we were finally able to uh, perform the key exchange. So, And then we saw a fireball uh, riding into the sunset, and uh, the satellite was no more. But yeah, so it's an embedded system. We're, of course, always worried about resource usage. And I have here pulled up the, the memory requirements in, in flash and RAM for the Kyber algorithms with different key lengths compared to the default encryption standard in the CubeSat space protocol. So we have XT for encryption and uh, SHA-1-based HMAC. And, and both of those are to my knowledge, already outdated in the classical sense, so it's already broken without quantum computers. But then also, you should see that both authentic authentication and encryption use like five, six times less flash than only a key exchange. And the other thing is uh, execution time, uh, if you want to perform a lot of key exchanges. And again, here we have Kyber. 512 compared to the encryption mechanism XT. So again, they, they don't do the same thing, so it's not quite fair, but still gives you some sort of feeling. Uh, you should see that these functions of uh, the key exchange use almost 250 milliseconds on this small system. And that's a lot of time considering that you need uh, three functions for a full key exchange, and then you end up at half a second for one key. Um, so that's definitely something you need to be aware of, uh, which we are. So when we're looking into the future, 
uh, we want to uh, move towards more powerful onboard computer hardware, uh, maybe FPGA, maybe Cortex application cores. Uh, Linux would be quite easy. Um, and, and also do user authentication with uh, another one of those winning post-quantum algorithms, uh, which would be Dilithium. And we're also in, in talks with the European Space Agency, who wants to put public key distribution into their SDLS uh, protocol. So I think that's something similar we heard before. So we have a student proposal or student project proposal for that. And uh, with that, I would like to conclude this presentation. I would also like to thank the Center of Quantum Technologies for lending us uh, the last hours of their satellite. That was very kind of them. And uh, I hope I motivated some of you to consider the quantum thread. And if there's time, I would take a question. Yeah, thank you very much. Any questions, please? We have a couple of minutes. They have the optimally placed bright light, just so it's difficult to see. Anybody have any questions? No? Okay. Thank you very much, Simon. Yep. Yeah.